to our friends, followers, viewers, good afternoon from Sydney. My name is Nick Hacker, and today uh, we will be talking about uh, a project update of NH3 Watch. Um, I have Andrew, who is uh, in lockdown at home, and I have Josh, who is in a Brookwell in a workshop. Hi, to how you two are doing? Uh, I should go first. Um, I think uh, being at home has definitely been a, a different experience um, to, to go on to work every day. But yeah, we're sort of pushing through and I'm doing what I can from home. It's um, not nice missing out on all the uh, watchmaking, but yeah, I got my tweezers here practicing my little motor skills, so I should be fine. <laughs> Very good. Josh, what's up uh, in Brookwell? Uh, we're blessed that we aren't that impacted by um, lockdowns here yet. At least every day it seems to be getting a little bit more restrictive. But uh, I'm hopeful that we can continue coming into work. And we have frankly, James and myself here, we've been uh, working at a mad pace, pushing out lots of uh, prototype pans and dials and dial components. And I'm sure you guys have all been seeing them on Instagram and in the newsletter. So uh, we've been full bore, full pace. Very good. Uh, before we go any further, let me just, uh, well, number one, if any of viewers want to say hello, you can post your comment and say hello and we'll say hello back to you. Um, I think we've got about 20 people watching this live right now. Uh, small crowd, but uh, loyal loyal supporters. Um, but before we go any further, let me just talk about something, uh, which is five hundred dollars cash. Um, today, we got ten Seiko to sell. Seiko five automatic watches. We have a green one, uh, which is uh, automatic uh, five hundred twenty-five dollars, and we have uh, Pepsi blue and red bezel blue dial as well as all black. So you buy one today by the end of the uh, presentation uh, and uh, you get, we're going in a draw straight into draw and today one person gets 500 bucks, uh, which I believe it's not a bad deal at all. So if any point of time you want to buy a Seiko, uh, I think we sold, how many we sold so far? We sold three, all right? We sold three so far. There's still seven to go, seven to go, and uh, we will be drawing live a winner uh, at the end of this presentation. One in ten chance is pretty good. Well, it's fantastic. I'm, yeah, you can't, you can't get in to draw yourself, Andrew. Sorry. No, no. This is for customers only. <laughs> right. So where are we right now with the NH3 project? Uh, we said last week that uh, we're thinking of uh, uh, doing uh, something different this time to, to kind of take it to next level after uh, uh, some time experimenting with a Gilios finish on titanium. We were close to make decision uh, last week whether we're going to go ahead with that or we're going to fit NH3 with uh, just a standard uh, brass printed dial like in the past. And uh, we're very, very, very encouraged by the recent development last last few days, especially uh, with uh, what we have achieved so far. And we're brave enough to now show you some of those those images. So, Josh, very quickly, 18 new components. Which components are those ones? Yeah, uh, we're doing an applied numeral dial. So all the numerals that you see are separate components that are uh, pressed onto a base style. So that includes the nameplate, which uh, is engraved with the, the Nicholas Hacko name. Then we have the uh, batons marking the hours. They are at the two, three, oh, sorry, one, two, four, and so on positions. And, and the only our spots that aren't marked by batons are the ones that are at the 12, 3, and 9 position. And then the 6 is omitted because we have a sub-seconds there. So those are all manufactured individually. 
and then we do the dial bass style as a, as a complete part um and then three sets of hands so it's it's uh as well as some other components that we need to manufacture on the movement side but uh yeah it totals up to 18 components 18 components plus all the jigs to hold those components yes yeah so a lot of these parts they aren't done in one operation in fact far from it they require multiple setups and multiple different machines multiple different decorative setups um so it's uh it's actually all about the jigs and the fixtures uh but they're not as romantic as showing the dial so a lot of these parts require quite a bit of time in polishing by hand and finishing by hand and making sure everything is right uh straight okay. out of the machine isn't always Just, right why why is a dial making and hands making such a big deal why is it so such a big deal like it was something that I, I said for five last five years past five years said no we're not getting into it no 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 because clearly dial and hands we're talking perfection and by perfection visual perfection mechanical perfection aesthetics uh materials used it's a complex thing but but, but why is it so, so such a big deal for an independent watchmaker and how many independent watchmakers actually make their darling hands well yeah just on on that complexity and why is it so hard um the the primary purpose of a dial is to tell the time and to tell the time effectively you have to actually have everything fit together properly you have to get a um uh, an assembly that integrates within the case and the movement and the hands within that movement so it's a, this big sort of sandwich and making sure the sandwich um doesn't topple over is one side of the story and then making the sandwich taste good or in our case look good is the other side of the story and uh, making it fit is not so much of a problem for us we've got the machines we've got the measuring tools um we can go back and forth but making it look good is really hard that's 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 by far the hardest part of this equation and um that's demanded not only by the design that's one fraction of the part of the, of the whole um sort of a uh, equation the other side of the equate part like the other equation of side of the equation is uh the finishes if the finishes have any blemishes if they're not um properly uh protected in the sequence of operations if they're not uh properly protected during assembly those finishes will be uh it's like that that broken leg on a string of um, legs on a on a caterpillar or a centipede you'll notice it instantly um so we didn't have the confidence to go ahead and say that okay yes we're going to put our necks out there and, and stand behind the finishes um that we can that we can put on this dial and only by making our movements and going through the process of hand finishing those components did we muster up enough courage to say okay let's put our name on something that everyone will see um, on the face of their watch so that's um that's the basics of it and you asked why is it important for an independent to make their own dial well it's it's a it's a multifaceted question um but the easiest the easiest sort of answer is to say that it's a it's the biggest step forward towards independence that you can that you can really make um having full autonomy on the design and the manufacture of your own dial means that you can iterate really quickly and it means that you can actually change your design within a set of you know 20 watches or 10 watches or five watches or make a single watch with this, this special dial um whereas if you're relying on a, on a, on a supplier uh, often there's a minimum order quantity involved or that if you did want a prototype dial um the the price is really expensive and so it might be prohibitive for your customers to even access something that's just a one off or might be prohibitive for you as a as a manufacturer to engage into a, like a unique piece um so yeah for an independent it's it's incredibly important because you're 
able to, at least in our case, we're finally able to marry our, the flexibility that we gain from making movements with the flexibility now that we've gained from making a dial. So those two things, it's like, uh, yeah, it's like two gears meshing really well. <laughs> and the, and the tr third and uh, step would be to actually manufacture a case and maybe one day even right. a bracelet. But for that, uh, our current milling machine is not, uh, uh, well, yeah, it, it, suitable it's, for that. We can manufacture cases. That's not a problem. It, what is a problem is manufacturing many cases. So we could make one case tomorrow and say that that's, you know, that's our new case. But for us to fulfill an order of, you know, 50 watches in a year, um, it simply isn't, isn't feasible on this sort of machine. Uh, it's not designed for mass production. And really, that's not even mass production. 50 cases a year is, is still a very small quantity. Uh, a lot of people have said, well, you know, you put all this effort in into making a beautiful dial and beautiful movement, um, and you've got this beautiful case, but it's, uh, I guess, it's been used a few times in, in the past. Well, the issue there is that we can't build an industry overnight. There's no one in Australia that we can go to and say, hey, can you guys make a case for us? Um, and at this stage, we're not ready to jump in, as it were. Um, full bore into manufacturing cases just yet, just yet. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, pattern on a dial or guillosh. Andrew, this is a picture of which beach? Uh, that would be a picture of Curl Curl Beach, which just so happens to be the closest beach geographically to where Josh is right now in the workshop. Yeah, it's one thousand four hundred something meters from a workshop. That's where Josh is right now. He can he can smell the salt in the air. Uh, it's northern northern side of a Sydney, so uh, it's called Northern Beaches. There are a number of beaches that look almost identical to this one, all the way north, at least another 25, 30 kilometer stretch, surface everywhere. Uh, and and Josh, tell me about the inspiration for the waves on a dial pattern. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, Coco wasn't the inspiration per se, but the first time we made this pattern, it reminded me of Coco. So uh, it was the sort of the first thing that I I pictured in my mind when I when I when I saw this come out of the machine and. Um, this pattern is actually developed on, it's a very classic pattern. Uh, it's not something that we've made up that's 100% unique, but it's based on uh, a rectified sine wave. So a sine wave comes obviously with a, the amplitude going up and down, or, sorry, the wave going up and down. And you have the full amplitude, which you can flip, you can rectify. So all the, all the waves that, or side of the wave that goes down, we flip up on the other side. So it sort of looks like a, uh, a set of hills. And so when you pattern these set of hills uh, with a specific offset, you get this pattern within a pattern um, that sort of eventuates with a lot of these guilloche or guilloche patterns. Um, so when, when I first saw this one, it looked like a, a set of waves coming into Kelkel. And Kelkel was actually surrounded by two headlands. Um, and so when you get a string of waves come in, it sort of... Uh, creates this cascading effect that looks, uh, I mean, quite poetically like the pattern that we have on our dial. And to me, that's, um, I guess, carries multiple layers of significance. Uh, it's my local beach, it's the closest beach to me. And on our, um, <laughs> on our lunch breaks, we can go over there and uh, have a walk and soak in some sun. But it's also where I proposed to my now wife um, I proposed on Kel Kel Headland. And so all these things have just sort of come in together and uh, explained the river of life, right? Well, Kel Kel in Aboriginal is river of life. And uh, this is a very same pattern. Now looking at it from a different angle. And and uh, I, I, I cannot help but to think of this as something uh, architectural, uh, 
surreal. There's a bit of Art Deco. There's a bit of everything in it. Uh, of course, we're not locked into this pattern. We can change the pattern of, of Gilles and Nadal. Uh, we can reprogram, redesign, uh, redraw, and, and do some other pattern. But regardless of pattern, the quality of Gilles, how do, how do we measure a quality of Gilles, Josh? So traditionally, there's two, two ways that Gilles has been presented in watches. The first is uh, naked. So it's straight from the cutter. Um, and the second is on a dial that's cut from silver that's been bleached. And that's a sort of a, a thermal and chemical process. Uh, and that bleached look uh, is, I guess it produces a very matte finished surface that doesn't have a lot of reflection in it. And a freshly cut Kiyoshi pattern has a lot of reflection. You know, it's uh, extremely reflective because the cutter is usually lapped on the on the cutting edge that um, and that lapped finish directly translates into the um, in, into the finish of the of the guilloche. So what's what's uh, quite interesting is that making making the pattern of of this kind, for example, is one half of the battle and the second half is making the finish of the pattern exceptional and the finish of the pattern can be inspected or can be sort of verified or um uh seen when you rotate the dial or rotate whatever's been cut and from one side you get a strong set of reflections and the other side it looks like nothing's even there. And that indicates that the flanks of the guilloche have been uh, cut in a way that produces a mirror surface. So traditionally, uh, guilloche is done in soft, non-ferrous materials. So you have silver, uh, which is, in, in high-end watchmaking, silver is probably the number one uh, dial material. Then you have uh, gold. So Breguet, for example, uses gold. Um, which they then uh, plate with <laughs> with rhodium to make it look like silver. Then uh, you have brass as well, um, and brass is used in sort of a, I, I don't want to say economy because many high-end brands do use brass, but it, it is the cheapest of those three. Um, and obviously, you have the variations. You can use a you can use rose gold or even white gold. Uh, to cut your video shape but what we wanted to do was see just as a pure test if we could do it in titanium so our our um curiosity got the better of us uh when we did this uh, all of our tests were just in brass because it's it's soft and it's easy to cut and you can uh cut many different iterations without needing to relap the tool often but uh, as soon as we sort of settled on a pattern, we said, let's try it in titanium. We've got a lot of experience cutting titanium from our contract manufacturing as well as our movement manufacturing. Um, so we thought, why not? And uh, not until we actually cut it and saw the results did we realize how good it looked in titanium. And, and we didn't know b last week that... Uh, literally, there's no other company in the world, no other watchmaker that uh, uh, do guilloche in titanium. And we ask our subscribers, hey, you guys help us have a look. Then we talk to other watchmakers, then we talk to other brands. We kept doing our research. And so far, we haven't found any other uh, watchmaker in Switzerland or anywhere in the world that actually use uh, titanium. Uh, as a, as a canvas for Gilioche, why why is it so, Josh? Why is why is what makes titanium so special? Well, it's f firstly um, there's a very technical reason why titanium is rarely used. Uh, it's it's limited in its ability to be cut quickly. So the cutting speed, which is a technical term. Um, that describes the speed of the cutting edge along the material is limited to about 35 to 40 meters per minute. Beyond that, the material actually starts to work harden 
and the the point of contact where the cutting edge is, is meeting the material um, starts to get extremely hot and heat is the enemy of any sort of cutting process. So um, long story short, we uh, you experience very rapid tool degradation. So you, you can't cut for long periods of time with the same cutting tool. You have to constantly change out your cutting tools. And uh, that's that's one of the main reasons why it's, it's rare to see titanium in watchmaking. Many watchmakers are used to working in brass or in, in gold or in other softer materials, uh, or, or like in steel, for example, in its soft state. Um, all of those materials are very easy to cut comparative to titanium. Um, and as we've been doing these guilloche patterns and learning more about the process, what's been extremely apparent is that um, the cutting forces involved in a scraping, scribing, or guilloche uh, uh, sort of working technique uh, are extremely high. It might not seem like a, a very large cut or a very large profile, especially when you consider we're doing one of these lines at a time. But um, the cutting forces are, are very high. They're extremely high, in fact. And what that means is that if you were to try doing, and, and obviously this comes with a caveat where I have, you know, I'm open to being corrected, but if you were to try doing titanium guillotte on a standard Rose engine or a standard um, straight line machine, uh, especially one of a really old vintage, you would be uh, always battling uh, what we call, what machinists call chatter. So because the cutting forces are so high, the tool is, is fighting almost against you to jump out of the cut. It doesn't really want to stay inside the cut. And uh, this, this all compounds to a worse finish and worse tool life uh, to the point where I'm not sure if many people were ever successful in their trials, private or public or otherwise. Um, I'm not sure many people were successful in creating something that was mirror finished. And... Uh, with the aid of modern technology, we are able to do that. Right. Um, There's a comment there, say, uh, knife makers have been using guillotine and titanium for quite a while, but where? This on is a handle? different type of guillotine. This is, mm. um, so the knurling that you see on handles in knives, as well as the, the patterning that you see in um, uh, decorative patterning in titanium, especially on knives, is cut in a rotational tool technique. So the tool that's cutting those grooves is um, is either is turning. That's that's when when they use CNC machines. Uh, often you will see in super high end knives people uh, uh, hand engraving knives for pattern. But uh, guilloche is slightly different to both of those in that a static tool is being used and the pattern is actually being generated by a moving workpiece. There's no rotation involved, and you're scribing this pattern into, into, the, uh, into the workpiece, which, um, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think many people have done this in titanium full stop, let alone in watchmaking specifically. All right. Um, the other problem that I had uh, personally with the, with, the, uh, with the titanium dials and guillotine dials is... Uh, realization that even if we are successful with the dial we still needed the hands and our markers and a name plate and and all that whole package we couldn't just use our old hands on a new dial and i was very reluctant and i always told you just so many times i told you don't touch hands hands are delicate hands are issue hands are hands are problematic because it's really in your face you cannot hide it has to be 100% perfect. Hands has to be perfect, as well as our markers. And, you know, for someone who spent my entire life looking at those beautiful dial and hands, whether they're made by Rolex or, or Omega or Jäger Lakut or IWC, you, I mean, in all fairness, you have to be humble and realize that it will take generation or maybe two to, to produce, uh, to output hands of that quality. But... I have to say our first and second and third attempt into hands uh, wasn't that bad at all. Uh, this is this is a hand 
Uh, maybe I should show you this one. Okay. Uh, take us through the hand making process in titanium. So, uh, generally, hands are made from brass or gold, uh, some, sometimes steel as well. Uh, but in mass production watches, it's generally brass or stamped sheets of gold. So, those hands are stamped in a progressive die or in a, um, uh, in a from strip really that's probably the best way to describe it and uh, the molds and the dies that are used to form and cut the hand during that strip um, or cutting from strip process uh, need to be machined from either steel or mod in modern times tungsten carbide and uh, it's that process, that whole process is really designed for mass production. We're talking hundreds of thousands of hands um, for, for those, the, the initial investment in, um, in, uh, in tooling to, to sort of pay off. Uh, so when you see a perfect Rolex hand, uh, that Rolex hand has actually been stamped and then fly cut or lapped to its final mirror finish. What we're doing um, is sort of slightly, slightly prohibited by the fact that our volume is so low, as well as the fact that we need to prototype these hands really quickly. So we can't commit to a single size or even style or even dimension. Any dimension can change as, as we've uh, sort of uh, explored in the last couple of days. Um, so these hands are milled from solid pieces of titanium. So that sort of in, in the photo that you can see that that gray disc that has all these cutouts. That's what we're milling all the indices as well as the hands and the, and the dial as well, obviously in, in, in a much larger disc. Uh, we're milling all of those parts from solid. Uh, and that's pretty rare. Not many people, not many watchmakers do this this way. It's sort of a, a very um, prototype-esque or low quantity um, uh, production style that's that you you will see in independent watchmaking houses but not many of the big watchmakers do it this way how long it takes to cut those two hands for example our hand and mini hand out of titanium and then to uh grind and uh anodize so if you to start from the blank how long will it take you to make two hands so I think if we got very good, <laughs> it's probably about a day's worth of work to get everything perfect and dialed in so it, it can be presented on the face of a watch. So if I order a set of hints tonight, I'll get them tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but would you be able to do anything in the meantime while the machine is cutting and while the, you, you probably would have some free time to do some other operations or some other parts yeah I, yeah it, it it's a mix a lot since while the machine is cutting yeah sure we could we could uh, have lunch or something, something like that but uh that's actually only half the challenge um machine the machine cutting the whole hand uh, and having it come off perfectly and ready to be installed in a watch is a myth uh, most, I would say, of the work, most of the work is spent in uh, hand finishing each one of these hands. And so you have to polish the hand. You have to straight grain it. You have to deburr it. You have to, in your case, ream it. You have to um, sandblast the underside so that you have no uh, uh, what we call like hairline or hair-like hair burrs. Um, and then the anodization process is very finicky. You can stuff it up and then you have to start the entire process again. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say a day's, a fair day's worth of work for a set of hands is, is, is pretty fair. Well, what, is, what is also important to understand and for our viewers to understand, we're not bragging about anything. We're just giving you the facts. And uh, this, is, this is how it is in our environment. Some other workshops, where they have 50 machines and, and 500 people, they can do things in their own way, different way, maybe if more efficient, maybe more beautiful, maybe you know cheaper and all that. But for us, for example, milling a hand out of a titanium blank means that our current machine 
is committed to that process and we cannot use that machine for anything else. That practically means if there is a customer who uh, wants something done, a contract work, uh, then hands making would go, you know, uh, uh, will, will become uh, uh, a low priority job for maybe a few days, maybe a week. And, uh, you know, any job when you work for University of Sydney last last project uh, with the with the telescope imaging machine, how long have has has uh, Kern been committed to to that project? Yeah, uh, well, just on on that project, we were we were about two weeks out of action from our watchmaking projects because of, uh, I guess, customer customer jobs. So, so it's funny that even for our own, like we set up a workshop to make watches, but if I want a watch component or uh, made, that does not mean that I will get it, you know, same day or next day or even next week, because there are other jobs in line where we have to kind of uh, uh, figure out what is the top priority, what is a lesser priority, and and uh, we have to kind of fit in our own time. That that could be very very frustrating sometimes. And also, if we change, for example, if we say, what is the hole in a second hand? Uh, 0.2, yeah, point two, five, I believe, is is uh, the second hole. Yeah, it, it should be point two point five. But uh, if you run out of drills, it will take you another week to order a new set of drills. And then that that project has to go has to go on uh, on, on hold. You know we don't have a luxury of having uh, every tool in the catalog, every drill, every cutter, every every thread uh, uh, forming uh, uh, a tool in in stock. So so these are all challenges. You know it's not that it's not that we don't want to do it. We want to do it, but we are very very limited with uh, with uh, what we have on 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 disposal. And uh, saying all that. Uh, you can only imagine how difficult it would be for someone else to enter this uh, uh, watchmaking in-house, watchmaking manufacturing in Australia. Uh, nowadays, it, it will be, you know, with, with the fact that we cannot travel overseas, that, that uh, what used to be overnight delivery or two days delivery from Japan, now it's two weeks delivery from Japan and things like that. Uh, uh, not, uh, cost alone. So we are lucky that we got into it early. Five years ago was not uh, too early, uh, but today I don't think we will be able to 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 start this business today. I, I you know financially and uh, with all the other constraints, it would not be possible. So to me, this is like if this was if this would be easy, then every workshop in Australia or, or who wants to get into watchmaking would get into it. The question is how many new watchmakers entered this market in Australia in the last five years since we got into it? The answer is none, zero. Uh, uh, would, uh, would a company like Cochlear uh, be able to output and manufacture hand like this? Yes, but uh, it wouldn't be any easier for them than it, and it's for us. Yeah, it's a tricky sort of, um, it's a tricky sort of gamble because the the capability in its sort of most objective rawest form exists in australia but it exists in isolated pockets within workshops that don't have access to each other and to to have a complete watch be able to be made in a single workshop requires that this machine from that workshop and that machine from the other workshop and more importantly the people who know how to run these machines and the, the people who know how to finish these parts all of that has to come in under one roof and uh i guess that's the main difference with what we're trying to achieve is we're sort of uh bringing as much of the knowledge as well as the physical or objective capability in in-house in one place i'll let andrew comment on a, on a functionality of a hand itself so we're talking about how difficult it is to make it how we didn't talk about how expensive it is to make it, but it is time consuming for sure. But when it comes to uh, hand, watch hand being a watch hand, what else is involved there from servicing side, Andrew? Well, more, more than I think most people would think so. 
on the surface level, the hand's job is to um, be fixed to a wheel and point to a particular uh, area of the dial, depending on what the time is, right? We all know this. Um, now, fitting the hands to the posts or the, the wheels below the dial um, is probably the first major challenge, purely because the fit um, has to obviously be tight enough so that the, the hands stay on with all the shock and all the you know environmental sort of characteristics of you wearing the watch. So if the fit isn't strong enough, you shake your hand or you bump into something, your hand falls off, and then the watch is essentially a mechanical oscillator with no other purpose. So that fit has to be absolutely perfect, um, but it can't be too tight either because what, or at least where we're coming from, we're trying to make a watch that's robust, reliable, and repairable. So theoretically, I will be taking those hands off, say once every five years for the next 50 years. If that hand fits perfectly once, slightly less perfectly the next time, and then doesn't fit at all 15 years from now, we better hope to have the same capabilities of making that particular hand. Now you've already heard Josh talking about the fixturing and you know all the supportive things that we have to build just to make a hand. If it's 15 years on, our design has changed, we might not even be making uh, watches closely similar to what I'm currently servicing. So for me to call up Brookvale and say, hey, I need a minute hand from an NH3, you know, that, that might become an extremely sort of expensive and um, time consuming task if we have to re go through all that sort of so all the support feature building all over again. So um, the fit of the hands is incredibly important and it needs to be such that the watch can be serviced. You have to take the hands off every single time. So that's one thing. To interrupt you here, this is the difference that, you know, I see comments here, oh, you know, um, Blamey, or I think I pronounced this correct, makes titanium guillotine pens. Uh, and that's cool, but, you know, on knife, but mm, pens and knives and chairs and tables and picture frames and, and, and you can, like, name it. Lots of accessories, a lot of tools are not built to be pulled apart every five years, completely overhauled, rebuild or put together readjusted with expectation to keep time at the performance level of 99.9998 24/7 while you're playing golf or scuba diving right you're not going to take your pen underwater you will have to take, you know, you can take your watch, on, uh, you know, uh, underwater, all those things. And your pen only, you use your pen and you put it aside and, you know, it might be six months or six years before you will use it again. Uh, watch is on your wrist 24-7, you know, so, yeah. so, 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 and has to perform and it has to be designed to be pulled apart and put back together. If we have a luxury, like many other makers, uh, to assemble a watch once forever, it will be a completely different story. Like we can make a fit between a hand and wheel so good, so perfect, that hand will never come off. Right? But <laughs> you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> you, that fit is not good enough. The fit mm. has to be loose to some, some degree. Mm. You know? uh, and one, one of the issues we face as well is that we're putting a titanium hand on a brass or a steel wheel so the difference in the material uh, characteristics becomes an issue um, as we were saying before most of the time you'll have um, a brass hand and it might be painted generally if it's going to be painted it'll be brass um, purely because it's just the easiest sort of way to do it but um, the interaction in those circumstances is a known thing watchmakers have been doing it for a very long time Whilst titanium does exist in the watchmaking industry, there really isn't that much of a tradition in, in titanium to know the answers straight away. So, you know, we like to say that we're all students of horology and, you know, we all are in our sort of different ways. Um, but this is something that 
you can't really learn from someone else because not many other people are doing it. And anyone that is, is completely shut off from giving you any answers. So that's probably the second difficulty is just in the material, you know, we have those issues. The third difficulty I would say is clearance. So you have two hands stacked on top of each other and a, a third hand below that has to be below the, the hour hand, which is the sub seconds hand. And that's pretty general across the sort of three hand, you know, with a sub dial uh, in the industry. But we have to have the hour hand clear over the top of the uh, indices, which we can see in the photo there, numeral three, and then uh, one of the batons. Um, it has to clear over the top of those. It has to be perfectly parallel with the dial, the, the plane of the dial. Then the minute hand has to have enough clearance between the hour and itself to obviously um, overlap 12 times um, a day. And then it has to have enough clearance between itself and the watch crystal so it doesn't scrape on the crystal and obviously create poor performance. So there's a few different sort of um, heights and dimensions we need to take into account there. And that's not including, you know, even just talking about the play that there is in the wheels depending on how much clearance there is, is sometimes enough to make the, the hands touch. So, you know, how far you push the hands down on the wheels um, is another issue we face when it comes to how tight they are. And there's there's a lot of things that we have to sort of, um, we have to sort of hash out as, as we're going, you know, and one of the issues we had was once, you know, Josh makes a hand, he sends it in to, to the city. Uh, Mr. Hacker's there reaming it out, making sure that the fit is perfect. We can't really measure that reamed hole. Like it is possible, but we're making things to the single digit micron level of tolerance most of the time. And the reamer creates a tapered hole on top of the fact that that hand has now been pressed onto the watch. Oh, that felt pretty good. Take it back off, send it to Brookvale, and then Josh has to somehow measure it. It's very, very difficult. So there's a lot of trial and error and even once we've got it right, trying to make that, trying to hit that number consistently on such a delicate part, on top of the fact that it's got so many post-processed finishes, uh, it's very, very difficult. And, um, you know, it, the good thing is we're sort of looking forward to the challenge, I suppose, but yeah. I, I can tell you, Andrew, uh, that uh, tolerance between brass stamped hand like on Omega or Rolex or, or uh, to uh, a steel pinion easily 10 microns mm. with titanium it's less than five and it's more likely two to three because titanium is so rigid there's no deformation in titanium steel is rigid it, the, the fit has to be perfect. And I, I, I don't know if we have any watchmakers. They would know what exactly I'm talking about. Mm. But as you said, we cannot measure. And literally this morning, I told Josh, our hand is perfect. Don't touch it. Minute hand, go two microns larger. Mm. Uh, uh, these are scary numbers. Like, I mean, seriously, I mean, what does that even mean? Go two microns. How did I came up with two microns? Well, after after fitting hand 20 times, you know, and, and going through four different iterations, I feel it's right there. I feel that it will be within two microns, you know. Mm -hmm. And then his job is now to get it within two microns. And this is why I'm saying it takes two to make a watch, right? I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, you can say any company, X, Y, Z, I'm saying Cochlear, for example, because I know they're really, really top notch or resmed workshop in, in Australia, they can make those things, whether they hit the two micron tolerance every time on a hand, I doubt. Do they have watchmakers there in their team who can tell them like, you know, this is the tolerance where we want you to be? I know for sure they don't. So so we, we constantly, constantly say two things. It takes two to make a watch, a watchmaker mm. and a machinist. And, and both of them have a hard time in, during prototyping. Once everything is done, uh, uh, research, everything fits, comes to assembly, no problem. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it has to be said for anyone watching that sort of thinking, oh, it's black magic, like there's no way you can feel two microns. We might not be able to feel two microns, but you can feel the difference between 10 and 12 because 12 doesn't fit and 10 does and it fits perfectly and eight is too, too small. So yeah. 
you know, you, you can definitely feel it. When you've taken hands off and put them back on hundreds of times, you can tell whose hands are really good and whose hands are not. Rolex, absolutely fantastic hands. Absolutely awesome. fantastic. The best hands. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, if anyone's watching from Omega who actually works at Omega, I don't know who you have to tell, but that Speedmaster <laughs> sweet second hand is way too bloody tight. They need to just loosen it a little bit just to make it easier for us, you know? But, um, but you yeah, you, you can tell. It is something you can tell. All right. Let's, let's just talk a little bit about our markers themselves that they, they are what were we talking about the thickness and the pins length and diameter josh yeah rob asked a great question he asked if these uh numerals are wire cut and um this would be a really good method of doing it and we've done it in the past um but we found that uh when you do wire, a wire cutting process you always have a tab that gets left over and if you don't care about the tab and you're just purely prototyping uh you can just file the tab off and then finish the rest of the uh the owl marker by hand but uh when we mill the owl marker in one clamping uh the finish on the side walls of the numeral or the batons or the hands is far far better than it would be uh from uh from the wire edm so we can then uh polish these hands and these numerals and all these applied indices far better to a much higher level if they're milled so they're obviously very small <laughs> all, all these parts uh, the batons are probably the most challenging to make they are uh, about three millimeters long and they're about 0.6 millimeters wide and they have two pins on the back side. In fact, all of these applied numerals have two pins uh, on the back side that act as the dowel pins to guide the, the, uh, the numeral as it's being pressed into the dial. And they also serve as the retention mechanism. So if, you, if, the, if the applied numeral was just placed on the dial, it would obviously fall off. But if it's press fit, if those pins are press fit into the bores in, of, and you can see somewhere on this presentation there's a photo with the dial with just the holes um if the if the applied numeral is press fit it's retained in the dial and there's methods of doing other, this i mean a lot of watchmakers create quite long pins and uh simply have them um sort of slide into the holes with a very loose fit and then peen the backside of the pin on the on the backside of the dial or even glue it. AP, from at least their marketing videos, glues their numerals to their dials. But we are press fitting them, so it's a friction fit, it's a mechanical fit. And the pin diameter is 0 0.2 millimeters. And a press fit between a titanium pin and a titanium dial, uh, we've done sort of lots of tests a comfortable press fit lies in the range of a five micron interference so we're trying to keep a hole tolerance in the dial for these pins to go into of uh let's say 0 0.2 millimeters plus or minus two and a half micron um and a similar tolerance on the pin as well on the on the actual applied indice so the the batons are yeah they're the most difficult because they combine a very very small surface area so it's extremely difficult to hold um, with obviously the challenge of making making these pins on the back side the numbers themselves have a different sort of challenge which is uh that the internal radius of the like the sharp corners the sharp internal corners um sort of force you to use extremely small tools so we're using up to a 0 0.3 millimeter end mill to profile these these numerals out of titanium, and uh, there are lots of issues, I guess, with with that. Uh, using these very small cutters um, in titanium means that they wear quickly. It looks like we're at, uh, about 10 to 15 numeral, numerals per cutter, which uh, I'm not too surprised by, but I wish it was more. Um, those tools aren't cheap. And, and and the other complication is that with a lot of typefaces, with a lot of fonts, uh, the numeral gets extremely thin in some in some areas. 
Um, and that becomes a challenge to ma actually manufacture. And then once the uh, patrons and the numerals and nameplate is machine, then next step is to assemble uh, the dial so that they are they're pressed into a dial. And uh, uh, Andrew and I uh, said the other day, I have no idea how is Josh managing to press them in because I did struggle a bit and you already said that your work is better than mine. <laughs> uh, you're not even a watchmaker. Uh, bloody <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you, you, you know, I'm using a standard uh, drilling press to press them in, but you made actually a better press and a tool holder, so, so you're cheating. Yeah, so I mean, the drilling press could work if you are very skilled. How about that? You're using the wrong tools and you're getting an okay result. So it's not entirely your fault. Um, but each one of these is these indices is actually pressed in uh, not quite a custom tool per indice, but uh, definitely you have to match the size of the tool that you're using, both to support the dial from the underside as well as to um, uh, sort of push the indice down from above. And the reason why dueling presses don't work all the time is that the force that you're applying is coming through, let's say, a four millimeter or a three millimeter shank down the middle of the press tool. But we've got much larger press tools here that um, have much larger bores. So the force, uh, the actual pressure is, is spread over a, lot, a, a larger area. And that is aided, obviously, by the, the actual um, inserts or the, the tool, tools at the very end of the press tool that help. But all to say that it's complicated. It's, it's not so easy just to kind of push it with your thumb and your finger into the, um, into the, into the dial. Um, I see, yeah, uh, Rob from Geneva Blue uh, has, is asking some really, re really great questions. Um, yes, the pins are integral. So he asked if the pins are machined into the actual indice and numeral in one operation. Yes, they're all one piece. So um, there's no chance of the pin delaminating or sort of um, uh, breaking off of the of the numeral. And then he asked another uh, <laughs> question about the internal radius, which yeah we've answered with the 0 0.3 end mil and uh, and smaller. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's talk about you know we we should be wrapping up. We are, we're bit, we're close to an hour already. Let's talk about uh, a little flex. That happened last night. Uh, clearly, we would like to to you know sell NH3 with um, titanium uh, dial and hands to to watch enthusiasts and collectors, but uh, we also like to use this watch as a showpiece and showcase piece to our um, contract manufacturing customers. And uh, we came with this idea where we would uh, you know. We use a watch to 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 convince them. It's a them business card. It's a business card. Yeah, bravo. That that's the word I was looking for. Business card. So so here's the plan. We show them NH3, and I say, hey, can you see can you see slots in the hands? And they look and say, yeah yeah, we can see. Oh bloody hell, there's tiny little slots in our hand, and there is a one in a minute hand. And then we go like, no, we are talking about a slot in a second's hand. And then they they will be blown away. I mean, I can I, I can only you know you you have to you have to see their faces when they realize that there is a slot, uh, there is a slot in a second hand. And this is a second hand, and that's a slot. And this is a, I this morning I fed a hair through the slot. So this is your human hair uh, in a slot that was actually how how was made, Josh? Someone said, oh, is it a laser cut? No. Uh, well, um, <laughs> I, I, I had these cutters, uh, these 0 0.15 millimeter cutters um, sort of lying around. We were using them for another project um, and I'd never cut titanium that small. And uh, I saw the slots that we were making in the hour and the minute hand and I wanted to replicate that in the second hand. But internally, I had a lot of sort of uh, doubt and skepticism that A, it was a good idea, or B, that it would look any good, or C, that we could even do it. 
Um, and so to dispel all the skepticism, I just did it. I just tried it. And it uh, came out actually, I mean, you can't say this humbly. It's impossible to say humbly, but it came out really well. And uh, what was amazing to me is that we're at the point where these sort of we're, we're at the point where the scale of the, the features that we're making especially with this slot um they're difficult to manufacture in every single machining or traditional machining method um they're difficult to wire edm it would, this would be next to impossible to wire edm because it's a it's a closed form it's difficult to uh hole of of 100 yeah, microns that's right exactly right um it's difficult to sink a edm it'd be very difficult to erode this away with a fixed electrode um your electrode would have to be extremely accurate and also well placed uh, and it's also very difficult to laser cut uh because the kerf of the laser has a thickness or it has a kerf and also there's a heat affected zone from laser machining un unless you go into sort of femtosecond lasers which you know it's like a million dollars per machine sort of thing um uh so we're, we, yeah we're really at the i hate the analogy or the the sort of phrase but the cutting edge we're we're, we're pushing the limits is maybe the more appropriate phrase uh, of what is even possible with conventional machining strategies and obviously you can say okay but you can use photolithography to um machine features that are in the nanometer range well i'd, I'd love to see who's uh using uh lithography to make hands but this was a flex, it, as Nick has sort of uh, really aptly described, and not necessarily. I mean, okay, there is one. There's one sort of facet to this whole project about this dial, which is that we're limited by what we can do in this workshop. We don't have pad printing. We can't print um, uh, uh, or ink on the dial, so we can only engrave, or we can only add um so when you put those limitations on on a dial project like this you you have to be extremely creative of how you add detail because a lot of watches and watch dials rather they add detail through the pad printing process which is the easiest and also probably the best way to do it because you can get extremely fine lines and Great examples come from uh, Kari Vukalainen's dial factory, Colin Mine, who made dials for Kikuchi Nakagawa, for example. That, you know, perfect, absolutely perfect pad printing. But because we can't do that, we have to do perfect something else. And in this case, it was all about inviting the customer to inspect closer. So it's inviting the customer to look at this guillosh under a microscope and to see how how well is it finished. They couldn't print it, they couldn't stamp it, they had to cut it, but how well did they cut it? Oh, wow, there's a slot in the minute hand. Let me inspect that, let me look closer. So the simplicity of our dial is a calling card to inspect the quality of our work closer. Uh, and this seconds hand, I guess, is the, it's sort of the, it's sort of the, uh, I guess, culmination of that idea in, in one part. Um, and 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 overall look, overall look uh, is I would say typical small independent watchmaker look. If you go on Instagram, all independent watchmakers dials look the same. I. Uh, a number one because they were most likely made by in the same factory or they're using same technique to to be finished then you have uh, josh shapiro who is the next level altogether and uh, but they all they all look they all look similar in a way you, you can see that they're not perfect they're not perfect like a rolex dials but they are either handmade or man-made or extremely complex in, in their in there from either technical aspect uh, and and you know when when you uh, I have to talk about price here right now Josh you you have some ideas what what 
what a Gilios da like this would cost if if we to order one from Switzerland. I mean, we have to be honest and put things in perspective. Well, a, a lot, a lot, and we're talking sort of mid mid four figures to develop a dial like this. Um, and those that's that is at, to a quality standard as well. Obviously, you can get dials that are far cheaper than that, but you might be stamping guilloche instead of cutting it, or um, or you know having printed numerals instead of applied indices and so on and so on. But for this kind of dial, it's it's really in the four figure plus 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 range. Mm. Well, I think this this is pretty much it. We we still don't have a. We're not taking orders yet. There are still a couple of things. You know, the nameplate is. We had the nameplate on the uh, previous model. Now we on dial version. Now we. When is the nameplate going to be done, Josh? Uh, it's actually done. I've got two here, uh, right. and that will aid our decision whether we go one way or another way. There's two different styles, uh, but they're done. Okay, so realistically, when do you think we will be ready to take orders for first 25 NH3 watches? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'd love to say um, that we could post up some photos and confidently take orders. I mean, we can take orders now. That's not a problem, but we won't be confident in that. We still have a few things to left to tweak, and maybe we have to um, explore a couple of different manufacturing options, or like how to manufacture certain components um, that we've been prototyping up until now. Uh, but I I'd love to say that by sort of the end of August, we can confidently take um, uh, take orders for the first 25. And if it happens before then, which it might it, it may well happen before then the only reason why it would be happening before then is because um we're we're confident enough to do it we don't want to rush this we don't want to say okay we're you know placing orders uh, taking orders now place your orders um and then not deliver because the worst thing that we can do is is um is fall short on the most important promise which is to deliver the product uh so yeah by the end of august i'd say we can start start the process and uh, uh, we don't have a firm price yet, but we're thinking about with the with the Guillaume dial watch like this NH3 movement, uh, custom main plates, uh, bridges, cut gears, finishes, blue screws, like a lot, a lot. We we never we didn't talk about movement, but the whole package in titanium case. We're thinking. We really think. Don't hold me. Don't hold me uh, down to last cent, but I would think it's seven thousand nine hundred Australian dollars for a watch like this. I think for seven nine, I don't think you can buy independent dial, independent watchmakers with dial in hands. There's no way. I have not heard of anyone in that price price range. So, let alone being titanium, uh, let alone being manufactured in Australia. Can we do other colors, Josh? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing all these great questions and I'm struggling to keep up in the chat. Um, yeah, so the, we're limited and uh, we're limited in which colors we can give. Titanium can only be anodized in a certain spectrum. Uh, red, for example, is not a color that we can offer. But um, what we might do is, is make a few watches with a few different colors. Uh, but I'd say tentatively and obviously all these things are subject to change but tentatively we're going to stick with the blue for the first series um and unless a customer specifically requests a color uh that we're going to have to make more or less for that customer only so it's a big custom custom watch uh we're going to stick with this 23.1 volt blue as we like to call it yeah um plan for future uh ultimately we want to revisit uh, Taimascus project and offer uh Taimascus uh, Gilios dial that would be very very novel thing i, and then I think possibly... uh, this the, the Taimascus style will be something so unique because it's 
not only in I mean it's it's unique enough as it is in titanium that's that's the crazy thing about this whole this whole venture into Timascus. We didn't have to go any further into into doing this style in Timascus, but that's what I wanted. I want to see at the very least. I want to see it because, um, and you've mentioned this a few times now, Dad, that um, we've had a lot of people, a lot of people say, "Why don't you put Timascus on the dial? And why don't you do this?" And now I think for the first time we could probably satiate that question, um, uh, but. You know, if it doesn't look quite right, it just means that we'll uh, we'll have to sort of uh, file it away for a, for a rainy day. Mm. But it is it's it's possible. You know, I I also see this as a possibility. You know, Timascus Guillaume Dal. To me, this would be a big, big, uh, big, big flex. You know, for a small independent Australian watchmaker. Uh, also, possibility of doing a titanium dial on Mark One, and you know, so we can offer we can offer. Uh, three thousand eight hundred dollars watch plus the cost of dial and hands uh you know large dial and hands in a smaller size so so there are, there are a number of opportunities uh for us we, we excited about the future uh we excited about uh what what is what is uh you know what future will bring uh we are grateful for support. I have to, you know, I, I, I'm keep repeating myself, but every time I say this, I mean it to the full. Project like this is possible only because we are <laughs> we are faith based ministry. Like we 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 <laughs> we're supported by people who love what we do, and uh, and you know we don't beg for money. This is not e begging. We, we we sell product we we uh, we stand behind what we sell we don't want you know money because you know we're doing something uh, hard in Australia we don't expect anyone to pay for that but we are grateful for people who have invested in our watches there's over 1,000 NH watches out there you know from Rebelde line from from NH1 NH2 uh, Mark one there's there's over 1,000 people out there who wear a watch. With what, with my name on it, and I, you know, and and which is which is just a, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm. This is fantastic. Like you know, we we, sh we shouldn't be too humble about this, but we need more support. We need more support. We need people to 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 understand that what we're doing here is 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 something that has not been done in in this country, and you know, we're doing things that have have not been done even even on a, on a global scale. It would be much easier for us to 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 grow and sell more if we are in Europe or if we're in Asia or if we if we're in America, but we are in Australia. We love this country. We're proud of uh, who we are, uh, especially kids who are born here. I wasn't, but we're proud of it. We wouldn't go anywhere else. Maybe maybe to New Zealand. That's 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 the only place I would move everything to to uh, you know to joking. So we need your support. You know, if you see value in this and if you say, hey, you know, I understand I'm not making these guys, you know, rich and wealthy, but I'm, I like what they do. And and we are, you know, we believe that what we can offer is an asset to this country. Then, you know, by all means, you know, get in touch and put your name down on, on a waiting list and wear proudly a watch that is more and more and more manufactured in Australia than, than, than ever. So finally, let's go quickly to Seiko. Uh, Gemma, how many Seikos have we sold? We sold only four Seikos. That's a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed with the, with the four watches sold. But hey, <laughs> we, are, we are so busy with our things. Let, let's just go back uh, to Seiko thing. There you go. $500 cash, one in four chance. Uh, if you haven't, last call. How about this? We'll give people like two seconds, uh, two minutes. If someone wants to call Gemma and buy a Seiko for 500 bucks, and now you only have, like, it's, wow, it's amazing. It's it's one in four. We sell one more, you'll be one in five. It's it's fantastic chance to win 500 bucks. Uh, I have to say, you know, while, you, while you're thinking of, you know, should I buy $500 Seiko or not, Seiko pays bills. Seiko is fantastic. You know, we make money selling Seiko watches. We don't make money selling NH watches because they're too expensive to manufacture. 
but Seiko is fantastic. You know, Seiko pays the bill, Seiko pays the wages. We love Seiko, Seiko loves us, and we will continue to sell more and more Seiko watches. You sound like Archie. Archie Luxury. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> uh, the link is in the, you know, somewhere. The link is somewhere. Come on, guys. Can we sell one more or two Seikos for your chance to win 500 bucks? Let me see what's the emails. There's another one, a frugal deal. There's another one. We sold Rolex, we sold Cartier, we sold them. How about a couple more Seikos? One Seiko, maybe? Guys? <laughs> no. All right. This is the ultimate call. I love it. Last call for salvation. A Seiko. <laughs> All right. So, so we have a name here. Number one is Richard. Number two is Philip. Number three is Ron. And number four is Jack. Uh, get off the fence and tell us what you really think about Seiko. Uh, I mean, uh, can, I, can, I share this? can I share this with you? All right. So, you know, I, I come from, uh, I was born in a small communist country. Uh, or, uh, and, and I arrived to this country when I was already 29. Couldn't speak English, had no money. You know, the rest is, the rest is what you see. Uh, but I'm third generation watchmaker. And, and I'm talking to you, Rob, now. Uh, I'm third generation watchmaker, and my, my, my grandfather sold Seiko watches, and uh, my father sold Seiko watches, and I'm selling Seiko watches, and I can guarantee you that Josh will sell Seiko watches. That's how mysterious we are. Josh will be four, he will never be a watchmaker, he will always be a machinist, but he'll be a machinist that will sell Seiko watches, right? And Andrew is here to keep him on a, on a track. If I drop that to, to tomorrow, you know, you guys will continue to sell Seiko watches. But what I'm trying to say is this. So last year, November, we started uh, uh, dealing with Seiko. And I called my mom. My mom is 80 years old. And I said, Mom, I'm now a Seiko dealer. And she goes, what that means? I said, I'm selling Seiko watches. And she goes, where are you smuggling them into Australia? How are you smuggling <laughs> them into Australia? Because all my mom and dad used to do and grandfather used to smuggle those Seikos in a communist country. And my mom can't understand that I don't have to smuggle Seikos you know, into <laughs> Australia. <laughs> and this, this is, this is a, a bloody true story. So, so I, love, I love the fact that I don't have to, to smuggle Seikos in, in Australia and that uh, we have a sales rep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who is Kiwi, and he's the nicest guy ever. So if, when we need more Seiko, we just pick the phone and we order more Seiko. But supply is not that strong. Even, even Seiko in Japan is struggling, struggling to supply. Uh, the demand is so, so, so great for Seiko watches. Seiko is, Seiko is an honest product. It's a, it's a fantastic watch that fits beautifully into that uh, segment that was left vacant by Omega. Omega wants to be Rolex. Rolex wants to be Patek. And Seiko wants to be Seiko, and it's fitting perfectly in that five hundred to thousand dollars price range. So, how difficult is to sell Seiko? I say everyone should sell Seiko. Anyway, I've sold four today. Four Seiko watches, fantastic. Quick draw. I don't know if you guys can see this. We've got only four balls here. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. I'll just pick one. I don't know if you see me kind of rattling those balls in. It's only four. So four Seiko. For Seiko watches, and I'm picking one, and it is number number three. Oh, you go, number three, Ron Lenham. Ron, congratulations! You got five hundred bucks from me. Five hundred bucks in cash, Ron. And thank you for your business. And we appreciate we appreciate your business to all, all of you who who uh, you know supported Sydney watches so far. Uh, that's all, Andrew. You have something to say, um, uh, you know, for the end, or before we get actually Michael on for for a minute? Uh, no, I think that was it. We, I think we've answered pretty much all the questions. Josh has been very diligent answering all the questions in the YouTube chat, so Try yeah, no, I think we're all good. All good. Well, uh, I'll just let Michael uh, share with us a thing or two about the uh, about the uh, camera newsletter, Michael. 
Hello everyone, as you can see, I'm still stuck at home. Um, good weather though, nice and sunny. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, today's main input in the camera news that we'll be talking about this camera, which if you're looking at it now on the screen is a very interesting looking thing. Um, this is actually French made uh, during the 70s. And this camera is a Super 8 camera, so it shoots that kind of micro film, micro home cinema film. Um, and it's actually used by Hollywood uh, twice in the past 10 years that I can recall uh, to shoot um, to shoot Super 8 film. So when they want to kind of emulate an old style look, they turn to this camera to get that because of how advanced and kind of how precise and uh, how many different things, amazing things this camera can do. So we'll talk more about that on the newsletter. Oh, okay, and uh, what is the newsletter called? Uh, so it's uh, vintagecamera.com.au, and today is the holy grail of Super 8. So that's this yeah. camera. Is, is that camera for sale? Yes, it is, actually. Um, you can see more details about it in the newsletter. Um, but, yeah, this is this is an extremely rare camera. You, you really don't come across these too often, um, especially in working condition. Um, and they actually still have their... Uh, facility, their old manufacturing facility. They don't make anything, but there is a service center and a part center where they, um, in France, they still disassemble and fix the cameras. What is it called? It's Bolu. So this is a Bolu 4008 ZM2. So this specific model is the same model used by J.J. Abrams and Steven Spielberg in the movie Super 8 to shoot all the Super 8 films. Right. Okay. Very good. Um, so, yeah, very, very thank you very much. Uh, you, your enthusiasm is encouraging, and and uh, we will love what you do with the with the cameras. It is an expensive hobby for us, but uh, we will love the fact that we have created a little boutique environment. Yes, we're in lockdown, but one day things will go back to normal, and we will offer uh, uh, a Sydney Siders opportunity to walk into uh, a Castle Ray Street shop where they can. You know, really, really spend some time. You know, looking at some cool uh, vintage film cameras from golden, golden mm. days of film cameras. I, yeah. I think this is, you know, as you said last time, this is something that is reserved for for rich kids in Asia and Japan, and mm. and you know, but not not Australians. No, definitely not. Not until now. <laughs> not until now. Well, thank you very much, Bobby. Um, enjoy your 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 work from home, and Andrew, you as well. Enjoy your work from home. And uh, I'll see you. I see you all uh, maybe on Monday. Thanks for all viewers. Uh, have fun and uh, keep collecting those watches and cameras, and fake rules. <laughs> see you. Bye.